So I think all of us uh, love some of those epic movies. Uh, I, I kind of forget now that The Lord of the Rings is actually considered an old movie now. Um, I've met young people who don't actually know what The Lord of the Rings is, but there you go. Um, a lot of these, these big epic movies that like have tell, they tell stories of like, you know, a whole country, not just kind of one family or one person struggling against whatever it is, but like a whole country and it all hangs on this one person uh, and, you know, these kind of epic stories where there are epic battles and, and that they, well, I don't know about me, but these are the kind of movies I like. Um, uh, you know, you think, you think of your, your brave hearts or your um, gladiators or that kind of thing. Uh, and one very common element in these kind of movies is that, so you have this hero who didn't actually set out to be a hero. He was just an ordinary guy who did the right thing and people ended up following him. Like, you know, William Wallace didn't say, oh, I'm going to be the liberator of Scotland. He just kind of ended up there. Uh, so one common element in, in many of these stories is, is the, the element of betrayal, okay? That very often, you, you, the typical dynamic of these movies is that the hero, as I say, kind of uh, unwittingly en ends up a hero. He just ends up you know, defeating some local bully and uh, becomes kind of a local hero and then you know, success increases. Again, like even you know, like a gladiator, Massimo Maximus didn't intend on being a gladiator. Or he, he actually, he says quite clearly, I shall not entertain. He doesn't intend on being a gladiator at all, uh, but ends up doing quite well. So they end up kind of this, in this pinnacle of success. And at some point then, someone on their side betrays them. So in William Wallace's case, it's the, the Scottish land, land nobles. In, uh, uh, in the case of Gladiator, Maximus there, he's uh, betrayed by, by the emperor himself. Okay, so, and it's, it, when this happens, you know, when this happens, like when, when you see like the, 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 the hero surrounded by his followers and then one of his own followers betrays him, that's when everyone goes, oh, oh that's bad. Like, you know, like the, you know, the guy who was at your side, who saw all the sacrifices you made, all the times you risked your life, all the times you bled, all the horrific decisions and difficult situations that you found yourself in, and how you, you chose right, and you chose even self-sacrifice, and you, chose, you didn't choose the easy way out. You chose to do what was right, even though it may have cost you your life, and so on and so forth. The guy who saw all of that gives away your location to the enemy or whatever it is. You know, and that's it, it's it, there's something horrible <laughs> about betrayal, something really kind of sinister about it. You know, you've been given something good, you've been given given this like privilege of, of a friendship or a relationship, and then you don't just kind of uh, kind of accept it and say, yeah, sure, I suppose it's it's not so bad, but to actually turn against it, right? You've been given this gift, and then we can actually say. Not only, yeah, sure, will I, will I use it, won't I use it, but I outright reject it and fight against it. All right, so it's very, very, it's, that's, why, that's why betrayal and marriage hurts so much. I mean, if someone speaks badly about me out there, it happens all the time, no problem. If I were to be married and my wife were to speak badly about me out there or if she were to post stuff about me, this will never happen for numerous reasons, but obviously, just work with me here. Uh, uh, if, if it were to happen, that would hurt a whole lot more. Why? Because she's the one by my... Why well, shouldn't use myself in this example? Any, <laughs> any of ye, right, who will do the whole marriage thing, right? Be, to be betrayed by the person at your side, so much worse. So much worse, okay? So, like, betrayal, that's what's... That's, that's, it's just a real knife to the heart, you know? So in the, the reading of today, we have Jeremiah, who pleaded to God for the Jews in Jerusalem. He pleaded to God that the Lord would have mercy on them and uh, that, that, that he would not release upon this, 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 this foretold destruction. And now those people that he prayed for are plotting against him. Those people that he prayed for, well, how do they phrase it? Let us concoct a plot against Jeremiah, the priest. Uh, the priest will not run short of instruction without him, nor the sage of advice. So we won't miss him. No one will miss him. He's the guy who, you know, prophesied in the name of, of God, prayed for them, for their salvation, for them to be preserved and not wiped off the face of the earth by God for all of their infidelity. Come on, let us hit him with his own tongue. Let us listen carefully to his words in order to twist them against him, right? And then the, the reading kind of fast forwards a bit to Jeremiah's prayer. Listen to me, Lord. 
hear what my adversaries are saying. Should evil be returned for good? For they are digging a pit for me. Remember how I stood in your presence to plead on their behalf, to turn your wrath away from them? And look now at what they're doing. It's just this kind of real knife to the heart of betrayal. Uh, Jesus in the Gospel, and he, he doesn't speak exactly about betrayal, but we know how the story goes. He does prophesy to his uh, disciples that now we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is about to be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him, condemn him to death and will hand him over to the pagans to be mocked and scourged and crucified. The Lord knows he will be betrayed. You know, it's, it's so hard. Now, fast forward to us. We've been given this great gift of faith. We've been brought into the family of God and actually made members of Christ's body. Okay, that's, this isn't just a kind of a nice theological idea or a metaphor. Well, it is a metaphor, but it's more than a metaphor as well. It's, it's, it's a spiritual reality. We've been brought into Christ. So, like, following the idea of you are what you eat, if we consume the Eucharist, then it's, it's Jesus' body and blood that, that flows in us. And if it flows in me and flows in you and flows in you, then we're, we're one body. It's, it's the one blood, if you will, that flows through our veins. It's, it's Jesus, Jesus that unites us. So we've been given this absolutely incredible privilege and gift and, and grace and honor. And it's so mysterious, it really is. So we have to be careful. We have to be so careful then never to fall into betrayal. And how does that work? How would that work for us? Well, in a way, it's quite simple. We, we know what the church teaches. And what the church teaches is a distillation of sacred scripture and tradition over the last 4,000 years, right, of, of, of God's revealed, uh, God, of God's self-revelation. It's all been kind of, so from Abraham, even, even further back, but from right up to our own day, all of sacred scripture, all of what we've learned from the saints, all of the prophets, all, it's all been kind of distilled and refined down to, to what we call now the teaching of the church, right? So sacred scripture and tradition, and the teaching of the church. It's all kind of brought together. This, this is, that, is that treasure, okay? Another way of, another way we could phrase it is maybe this, this relationship with Jesus, but we have to be careful of relationship with Jesus in the sense that um, sometimes you hear people using the, the, the expression, you know, I, I have my faith. I have my own faith. It, it's good to have faith. Yes, it's good to have faith. The difficulty with saying my faith is None of us as Catholics should have my faith. All of us as Catholics should have the faith of the church. Because I don't make this up. It's, it, it's not my faith. I didn't, make any, I, didn't, I didn't write any of this. You know, this, is, this is given to me. So it's not, it's not a product of, of my head or my heart. This is given to me. What we believe as Catholics is given to us. All right? it's, it's, our, it's this, I'll say this treasure entrusted to us. I didn't make it. I didn't create it. None of it. Not a single bit. So it's given to me as a gift. So what my job then is just to be faithful to that. And whatever I do, do not try and change it. Because who am I? Who on earth am I to go changing any of this? My job is to carry it faithfully. Now I might, not admittedly, I might not actually understand it all. I mean, I'm, I was just saying to someone yesterday, I'm a priest 11 years, I'm in religious life 21 years now, and I still feel like I'm at the beginning of all of this. Like there's just, it's, it's wonderful, it's fantastic, but God is always infinite, and we're really, really not. You know, we're really not infinite. So the more we, we start discovering about, about the Lord and about Scripture, the more we'll discover we don't know, right? It's kind of, it's kind of a paradox, because he's infinite. So we never run out of things, we never run out of, of, of a depth of prayer, we never run out of things that, that we can understand deeper and deeper. You know, we can read the same Gospels every single day and still get more and more and more out of them. So we never run out of things. So it's, it, my job is not to, to reinvent any of this, but just to be faithful to it and hand it on. To be faithful to what the church teaches and hand it on. Because there's always a tendency in the church, whenever there's a bit of a, a dip in our history, to think, what we need to do is change the teaching. If we change the teaching, then people will be happy or will join us, our numbers will increase, our young people will be fascinated by the church, and then on we go. If we change this, it's not Catholic. So if we change this and our churches are full and follow something that isn't Catholic, even if 
which won't happen, by the way, but even if the church were to be stuffed and people were swinging out of the rafters, it would be absolutely useless unless we're faithful to Christ. There is no point increasing quantity at the cost of quality. No point. No point having f huge numbers of people who gather for something that isn't Christ-centered anyway. There's just no point. It'll take loads of time, loads of resources. We'll be patting ourselves on the back and not a single soul will be saved. Waste of time. Waste of time. If it's not Christ-centered, don't bother. So we have to be faithful to this treasure and carry it on and pass it on. There's another quick story, if I may. Uh, we have these stories of betrayal. And you have a story, there's another story quite famous uh, from Les Mis, uh, of a guy who starts not as such entrusted with a treasure in a way, but he starts as a thief. And he steals something. Is it a bishop or a priest? Bishop. 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 And um, the bishop catches him. And there he is with candlesticks and whatever else uh, that he has just stolen from, from the bishop. Jean Valjean. And the bishop says to him, take them, basically but let them make you an honest man. Let them make of you an honest man. Even though you started wrong, it's less than ideal to break into someone's house and steal their stuff. I'm not recommending or advocating that at all. One should not start there. But the bishop gives him a chance. You started wrong, but now that you have something that you've kind of attained in the wrong way, let them make you from now on an honest man. And it actually works. Jean Valjean goes on to be a very honourable, I don't remember all the story, so I think he does end, end up to be a very honourable man. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. Uh, I, I'm too busy watching Gladiator. Um, so he ends up being an honest man, okay? So rather than being given a treasure and betraying, he's given a treasure and multiplies it and becomes a, a good man. Now, in, in spiritual terms, we've been given the treasure of this relationship with the Lord and with it, we can become saints. With it, we can become saints. And that will renew the church. So we ask the good Lord today to strengthen us in our fidelity, in our love for our church, in our love for what the church teaches. May we always have the courage to stand up for you, Lord, <clears throat> whether we are surrounded by friends or foes, whether we're supported or ridiculed. May we always stand with you and for you. May we stand at your side. May we model our lives on our Blessed Lady in her fidelity, on St. John, Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. Lord, may we stay with you until we see you rise on the third day. <clears throat>